All right, welcome back to uh, Network Plus Guide to Networks, uh, eighth edition, chapter seven, virtualization and cloud computing. Uh, I'm going to continue on with this lesson uh, talking about encryption and the encryption protocols. It's important to understand that data exists generally in three states uh, at rest, in use, or in motion. When data is at rest, it is most secure when it's stored on a device that is protected by a firewall, anti-malware, software, and physical security, such as being inside a locked room. However, these protections are no guarantee. And additional protections, including storage, uh, portions of the data, storing portions of the data, in separate locations so that no single portion is meaningful on its own. Data is in use, or for data to be used, it must be accessible, which brings inherent risks. Tightly controlling ac access to the data and reliable authentication of users help reduce these risks. You'll learn more about access control and authentication methods much later. Data in motion is when it's uh, in its most vul vulnerable especially when data must leave your own trusted network. It's exposed to a multitude of potential gaps, intrusions, and weak links. And as you've seen in earlier chapters, wireless transmissions especially are susceptible to interception, and wired transmissions also risk exposure. The number of devices, organizations, and, and transmission methods involved in sending a single email across the internet highlights the need for a layer of security that travels with the data. <clears throat> Encryption is the last means of defense against data theft. So in other words, if an intruder has bypassed all other me methods of security, including phys physical security, for instance, he's broken into the data center. And the network design security, for instance, he's defied a firewall's packet filtering techniques or removed encapsulated frames from transmissions, data may still be safe if it is encrypted. So encryption protocols use a mathematical code called a cipher to scramble data into a format that can be read only by reversing the cipher, that is by deciphering or decrypting the data. Now the purpose of encryption is to keep information private. Many forms of encryption exist with some being more secure than others. Even as new forms of encryption are developed, new ways of cracking their codes will emerge also. Now to protect data at rest, in use and in motion, uh, encryption methods are primarily evaluated by three benchmarks, confidentiality, integrity, or availability. Now together, these three principles form the standard security model called the CIA or confidentiality, integrity, and availability triad. Now, encryption can happen at various layers of the OSI model. Uh, so let's first begin with a brief description of what key encryption is, and then we'll explore some of the most common encryption protocols used to protect stored data on or traveling across networks. And we'll start in layer three and then work our way up the OSI reference model. Now, the most popular kind of encryption encodes the original data's bits using a key or a random string of characters, sometimes uh, several times in different sequences to scramble the data and from it generate a unique and consistently sized data block called ciphertext. The key is created uh, according to a specific set of rules or algorithms. Now, key encryption can be separated into two categories, private key and public key. Private key encryption, the data is encrypted using a single key that only the sender and the receiver know. Private key encryption is also known as, known as symmetric encryption because the same key is used both uh, during both the encryption and decryption of the data. The potential problem with private key encryption is that the sender must somehow share that key with the recipient without it being intercepted. In public key encryption, the data is encrypted with a private <coughs> key known 
only to the user and decrypted with a mathematically related public key that can be made available through a third party source, such as a public key server. This ensures that integrity as the sender's public key will only work if the data has not been tampered with. Alternatively, data can be encrypted with the public key and then can only be decrypted with the matching private key. This ensures data confidentiality as only the intended recipient, the owner of the keys, can decrypt the data. A public key server is a publicly accessible host such as a server on the internet that freely provides a list of users, public keys, uh, much as a telephone book provides a list of people's phone numbers. The combination of a public key and a private key is known as a key pair, and because public key encryption requires the use of two different keys, one to encrypt one to de and the other to decrypt, it's also known as asymmetric encryption. Now, with the abundance of private keys and public keys, not to mention a number of places where each may be kept, users need simple and secure key management. Uh, one answer to this problem is to use digital certificates. A person or a business can request a digital certificate, which is a small file containing the user's verified identification information and the user's public keys. The digital certificate is issued, maintained, and validated by an organization called a CA, a CA or a Certificate of Authority. The use of Certificate of Authorities is to associate public keys with certain users is known as PKI or Public Key Infrastructure. IPsec is, or Internet Protocol Security, is an encryption protocol suite that defines a set of rules for encryption, authentication, and key management for TCP IP transmissions. It is enhanced, it is an enhancement to IP version 4 and is native to IP version 6. IPsec works at the network layer of the OSI model and it adds security information to the headers of all IP packets and encrypts the data payload. IPsec creates secure connections in five steps. First, the IPsec initiation. Noteworthy traffic, as defined by a security policy, triggers the, in the in initiation of the IPsec encryption process. Second is key management. Through this process, two nodes will agree on common parameters for the key that they're going to use. This phase primarily includes two services, the, I key, uh, I, the IKE, which is the Internet Key Exchange, which negotiates the exchange of the keys, including the authentication of the keys, and the ISA KMP, or the Internet Security Association and Key Management Protocol, works with the IKE process to establish the policies for managing, managing those keys. Security negotiations, where the IKE the Internet Key Exchange, continues to establish security parameters and associations that will serve to protect data while it's in transit. Next, we'll have the data transfer. So after the parameters and the encryption techniques are agreed upon, a secure channel is created, which can be used for secure transmissions until the channel is broken. Last is termination. The IPsec requires regular reestablishment of a connection to minimize the opportunity for interference. Connection can be renegotiated, minimize the um, re can be uh, sorry can be renegotiated and reestablished before the current session times out in order to maintain communication. IPsec can be used with any type of TCP/IP transmission. Operates in two modes: transport mode, which connects to hosts, or tunnel mode, which runs on routers or other connectivity devices in the context of VPNs. Both are methods of encrypting TCP IP transmissions, including web pages and data entered into web forms. Both protocols will work side by side and are widely known as SSL or TLS. When a client and a server establish the SSL or TLS connection, they establish, <coughs> they establish a unique session. So the SSL secure socket layer and TLS transport layer security are both methods of encrypting. The two protocols can work side by side. All browsers today, for example, Google Chrome, Mozilla, Apple Safari, 
Microsoft Edge Internet Explorer support SSL and TLS to create secure transmissions for HTTP transmissions. The SSL was originally developed by Netscape and operates in the application layer. Since that time, the IETF, which is an organization of volunteers who help develop internet standards, has standardized the similar TLS protocol. TLS operates at the transport layer and uses slightly different encryption algorithms than SSL, but otherwise is essentially the updated version of SSL. SSL has now been depreciated and should be disabled whenever possible, leaving the more secure TLS to provide protection. Now, as you recall, HTTP uses a TCP port 80, whereas HTTPS uses SSL or TLS encryption and TCP port 443 rather than 80. So each time a client and a server establish an SSL connection, they establish a unique session or an association between the client and the server that is defined by an agreement of a specific set of encryption techniques. The session allows the client and the server to continue to exchange data securely as long as the client is still connected to the server. A session is then created by a handshake protocol, one of the several protocols within SSL and TLS, and perhaps the most significant. It, as its name implies, the handshake protocol allows the client and server to introduce themselves to each other and establish terms for how they will securely exchange data. Step one in the handshake, the browser representing the client um, sends a client hello message to the web server which contained information about what level of security the browser is capable of accepting and what type of encryption the browser can decipher. It also establishes a randomly generated number. <clears throat> the server responds with the server hello message that confirms the information received from the browser and agrees in certain terms to of encryption based on the options supplied by the browser. Depending on the web server's preferred encryption method, the server might choose to continue uh, to issue the browser public key or a digital certificate. If the server requests a certificate from the browser, the browser then will send it. And then any data the browser sends to the server is encrypted using the server's public key. Session keys used only for this one session are also established. And after the browser and server have agreed on the terms of encryption, the secure channel is in place and they begin exchanging data. A variant of TLS is data, Datagram Transport Layer Security, or DTLS, which is designed specifically for streaming communications. As the name implies, it relies on UDP instead of TCP, which minimizes delays. However, applications using DTLS must provide their own means of packet reordering, flow control, and reliability and, and assurance. DTLS includes security levels that are comparable to TLS and is commonly used in delay sensitive applications such as voice over IP and tunneling applications like a VPN. Brings us to remote access. Now, as a remote user, you can connect to a network and its resources via remote access, which is a service that allows a client to connect with and log on to a server, LAN or WAN, in a different geographical location. After connecting, a remote client can access files, applications, and other shared resources, such as printers, like any other client on the LAN. Now, to communicate via remote access, the client and host need a transmission path plus the appropriate software to complete the connection and exchange the data. There are all types of remote access techniques, techniques connecting to a network that require some of remote access server to attempt a remote connection and then grant it privileges to the network's resources. Also, software must be installed on both the remote client and the remote access server to negotiate and maintain this connection. Two types of remote access servers. We have dedicated devices such as Cisco's AS5800 access servers are dedicated solely as a RAS to run software that in conjunction with their operating system performs authentication for clients. An ISP might use a dedicated device to authenticate client computers or 
home routers to access the ISP resources and the internet. <clears throat> We can also have software running on a server. Now, the remote access service might run for a network operating system to allow remote login to a corporate network. For example, direct access is a service first introduced in Windows Server 2008 um, R2 that can automatically authenticate remote users and computers to, um, to the Windows domain and its corporate network services. Several types of remote access methods exist. Three of the most common, which we'll explore in greater depth throughout the section, are point-to-point -point remote access over a dedicated uh, line, such as a DSL or a T1 to an ISP. Terminal emulation, also called remote virtual computing, which allows a remote client to take over and command a host computer. Examples of that would be terminal, terminal emulation software like Telnet, or SSH, or Remote Desktop, or VNC, um, and then a VPN network, or a Virtual Private Network, which is a virtual connection that remotely accesses resources between a client and a network. Two networks, or two hosts over the internet, would then be able to connect to each other. Security and privacy are probably of the utmost concern when managing and using remote access connections. To this end, data is often encrypted before it is transmitted over the remote connection. Some remote access protocols natively include encryption functionality, whereas other remote access methods must be paired with a specific encryption protocol, such as the ones we talked about earlier. <coughs> Which brings us to point-to-point -point remote access protocols. Now, client remote access servers require an, an, an agreed-to protocol to establish a session or, and exchange data. An older protocol of this type is called SLIP, or Serial Line Internet Protocol, which is rarely used today. It does not support encryption. It can carry only IP packets, but not other network layer protocols, and works strictly on serial connections, such as dial-up or DSL. It's been replaced with PPP, or Point-to-Point -point Protocol, as the preferred communications protocol for remote access. Now, it's a data link layer protocol that directly connects two WAN endpoints, one example might be when a DSL or a cable modem connects to a server at the ISP. The PPP headers and trailers create a PPP frame that encapsulates network layer packets. The frames total only 8 or 10 bytes, and the difference, depending on the size of the F FCS field, um, re now if you recall it, the FCS field ensures the data is received intact at your frame check sequence. Uh, Here's what PPP can do. It can negotiate and establish a connection between the two endpoints. It can use authentication protocols such as MS Chat version 2 or EAP. Uh, it can support several network layer protocols such as IP that might use the connection. And it can encrypt the uh, transmissions, although PPP encryption is considered weak by today's standards. Now, terminal emulation, also called remote virtual computing, allows a user on one computer, called the client, to control another computer, called the host or server, across a network connection. Examples of command line software that can provide terminal emulation include Telnet and SSH and some GUI-based software. Examples are Remote Desktop and Join.me and VNC, TeamViewer. A host may allow clients a variety of privileges that merely viewing the screen to running uh, uh, to running programs and modifying data files on the host hard disk. Now, after connecting, if the remote user has sufficient privileges, she can send keystrokes and mouse clicks to the host and receive screen output in return. In other words, to the remote user, it appears as if she's working on the LAN or the WAN connected host. Telnet uh, is a protocol terminal emulation utility used by Telnet client server applications that allows an administrator or other user to control a computer remotely. For example, if you were a network admin working on one building on your school's campus, they had to modify the configuration on a router in another building, you could use Telnet to access the router and run commands for establishing a connection. <clears throat> Problem is, it has poor, poor authentication, no security for transmitting data, which means it has no, uh, no encryption. In essence, everything you're typing, including your username and password, are sent in clear plain text. 
We've then been moved into SSH or secure shell. It's a collection of protocols that does both authentication and encryption. With this, you can securely log on to a host, execute commands on that host, copy files to or from that host. SSH encrypts data exchanged through the session. It guards against a number of security threats, including unauthorized access to a host, IP spoofing, interception of data in transit, even if the data being transmitted um, <clears throat> to, is going to intermediate hosts. And also protects you from DNS spoofing, in which a hacker um, uh, forges the name server records to falsify a host identity. Depending on the version, SSH may use triple DES, AES, Blowfish, or other less common encryption schemes or techniques. It was developed by SSH Communication Security, and use of their SSH implementation requires paying for a license. However, open source versions of the protocol suite, such as OpenSSH, are available for most computer platforms. To form a secure connection, SSH must be running on both client and server. So like Telnet, the SSH client utility uh, that can run the shell prompt or a Unix system, <clears throat> and it must have the software installed on both. SSH listens on port 22. It is highly configurable. You can choose among several types of encryption method. It can also be configured to perform port forwarding, which means it can redirect traffic that would normally use an insecure port like FTP to an SSH secured port. It allows you to use SSH for more than simply logging onto a host manipulating files. With port forwarding, you could, for example, exchange uh, web traffic with a web server via a secured uh, SSH connection. Later, we'll configure port We'll see how to configure port forwarding on a Soho router. And at the end of the chapter in the capstone projects, uh, you can use SSH in Ubuntu. <clears throat> there are other types of programs that we can use for, for, the, for terminal emulation. And one is RDP, or Remote Desktop Protocol, and the VNC Network Computing, or Virtual Network Computing. Now recall that RDP is a Microsoft proprietary protocol used by Windows Remote Desktop and Remote Assistant Client Server Utilities to connect to and control a remote computer. Similarly, VNC, or Virtual Network Computing, or Virtual Network Connection, uses the cross-platform protocol RFB, which is Remote Frame Buffer, to remotely control a workstation or server. It's slower than remote desktop, requires more network bandwidth. However, because it's open source, many companies have developed their own software that can run OS on client computers, remotely access computers, tablets, and smartphones, remotely control media equipment, and surveillance systems. Next one I want to cover is management, U U management URLs using HTTPS. Now in the past, when setting up a new Soho router, small office, home office router, or other networking device, the user had to download and install a setup program from the manufacturer. Increasingly, networking devices are configured through a connected computer's browser that navigates to a management URL, where the user can make changes directly to the device. In the port forwarding, uh, in the port forwarding applying concepts project, uh, you used a web browser to configure a Soho router. You also used a browser to configure a Soho router in a hands-on project. Now, to do this, you enter the router's IP address into the address bar. All the device's configurations were completed through the web browser. Ideally, these device consoles require an encrypted connection over HTTPS, although this is not always the case. Without a band management, Telnet, SSH, RDP, VNC, and a management URL all rely on the existing network infrastructure for a network administrator to remotely control the device before he or she can configure these devices. They must already be booted up and they must already have configuration software installed. This is called in-band management. It inherently limits troubleshooting capabilities. Out-of-band management, however, relies on a dedicated connection, either wired or wireless, between the network administrator's computer and each critical network device, such as routers, firewalls, servers, power supplies, applications, security cameras. These dedicated connections allow network administrators to power up the device, 
change firmware settings, reinstall the operating system, monitor hardware sensors. Database management solutions come in an array of options from the basic uh, reboot abilities and full scale uh, device management. A remote management card is then attached to the network device's console port, or sometimes a remote management card is built into the device. Dial and modem, either through a wired phone line or through a cellular connection, might be attached to this device to provide a backup command line interface access in the event of catastrophic network shutdown. A single device, such as a console server or console router, provides centralized management of all linked devices. Which takes us to FTP. Now, although not technically a form of, of a terminal emulation, FTP transfer protocol does provide remote access. Now that you understand more about how encryption can, can uh, secure transmission, you're ready to understand that about some remote file access options related to FTP. Now recall that FTP is a utility that you can use to transfer files to and from a host computer using the FTP uh, server software. You learned how to use FTP in, in the Windows project, and you learned how to set up FTP server in Linux. Now the FTP app that you installed in Chapter 5 was called VSFTPD, which stands for Very Secure FTP Daemon. Now three related technologies include the following, FTPS, which is FTP security or FTP secure. It's an added layer of protection using FTP or for FTP using SSL and TLS to encrypt both and control the data channels. FTP is typically configured to listen on port 21. Like FTP requires two data channels. By default, those data channels are port 989 and 990. We have SFTP, which is secure FTP, and the file transfer version of SSH that includes encryption and authentication and is sometimes inaccurately called FTP over SSH. There's also TFTP, which is Trivial File Transfer Protocol. It's a simple version of FTP that includes no authentication or security for transferring files and uses UDP as a transport layer unlike FTP, which relies on TCP as a transport layer. TFTP requires very little memory and is most often used by machines behind the scenes to transfer boot files or configuration files. It's not safe for communication over the internet. It is not capable of giving users access to, to directory information and it limits file transfers to four gig. And it listens on port 69 and negotiates a data channel for each individual connection. Next, we want to discuss VPNs or virtual private networks. It's a network connection encrypted from end to end and creates a private connection to a remote network. A VPN is sometimes referred to as a tunnel. For example, a national insurance provider uses VPNs to securely connect its agents' offices across the country with its databases at the national headquarters. Now, by relying on the public transmission networks already in place, VPNs avoid the expense of having to lease private lines. private point-to-point -point connections between each office and national headquarters. We have different types of VPNs. A site-to-site -site VPN, where tunnels connect multiple sites on a WAN, and then at each site, a VPN gateway on the edge of the LAN establishes a secure connection. Each gateway is a router or remote access, has a, has a router or a remote access server with VPN software installed and encrypts and encapsulates the data to exchange over the tunnel. Meanwhile, clients, servers, and other hosts on their protected lands communicate through the VPN gateways as if they were all in the same private network and do not themselves need to run special VPN software. Site-to-site -site VPNs require that each location have a static IP address. We also have a client-to-site uh, site VPN also called a host site VPN or remote access VPN. <clears throat> Here, remote client servers and other hosts establish tunnels through a private network or with a private network through a VPN gateway at the edge of the LAN. Each remote client on a client to site VPN must run VPN software 
to connect to the VPN. A host-to-host -host VPN, two computers, create a VPN tunnel directly between them. Both computers must have the appropriate software installed and they don't serve as a gateway to other hosts or their respective networks. In a host-to-host -host VPN, usually, a site, usually the site that receives a VPN connection, such as a home network, needs a static or public IP address. Another option, however, is to subscribe to a server such as a dynamic DNS or DDNS by Oracle, which automatically tracks dynamic IP address information for subscriber locations. The beauty of VPNs is that they can be tailored to a customer's distance, user, and bandwidth needs, so of course, every configuration is unique. However, all shared characteristics of privacy achieved over public transmission facilities using encapsulation and usually encryption. The software or hardware required to establish VPNs is typically inexpensive and in some cases is included in the OS or a networking device's hardware. Many routers and firewalls have embedded VPN solutions. A router-based VPN is the most common implementation of VPNs on Unix-based networks as opposed to the server-based VPNs that Windows networks use. Third-party solutions also work with Windows, Unix, Linux, and Mac operating systems, server network operating systems. For large organizations where more than a few simultaneous VPN connections must be maintained, a specialized device known as a VPN concentrator can be used as a VPN uh, server. A VPN concentrator performs these following tasks. It authenticates the uh, VPN clients, establishes tunnels for VPN connections, Manages encryption for VPN transmissions. Two primary encryption techniques used by VPNs today are IPsec and SSL, which are learned, which we learned about earlier. Most VPN concentrators support their either standard, and an enterprise-wide VPN can include elements of both client, uh, client-to-site, and site-to-site models. A particular type of enterprise VPN using Cisco devices is called a dynamic multipoint VPN, or DMVPN creates VPN tunnels between branch locations as needed rather than requiring constant static tunnels for site to site connections. In this configuration, uh, <clears throat> sorry, in this configuration as shown here, a hub or router sits at the headquarters location and each remote office has a spoke router usually when hosting enterprise VPN connections. The involved gateways all need static IP addresses from the ISP. The dynamic uh, multipoint VPN, however, only the hub router needs a static public IP address. The spoke routers can communicate uh, with the hub router to create VPN tunnels as needed, even from a spoke router to a spoke router. The DMVPN configuration is achieved through creative adaptation and use of VPN tunnel uh, and tunneling protocols. So to ensure to ensure a VPN can carry all types of data in a private manner over any kind of connection, special VPN protocols encapsulate higher layer protocols in a process known as tunneling. Now you recall that IP version 6 hosts can tunnel through an IPv4 network and vice versa. The same process is used by VPN tunnel to create a virtual connection or tunnel between two VPN endpoints. To understand how VPN tunnel works, imagine a truck being transported across a river on a ferry. The truck is carefully loaded, tethered, and covered, and then is carried across the water to its destination. At its destination, the cover and tethers are removed and the cargo is unloaded. The truck can then drive on down the road as it was originally designed to function. Similarly, the VPN tunnel tunneling protocols can complete frames out, are encrypted, encapsulated, and transported inside normal IP packets in data link layer frames. In other words, a frame travels across the network as the payload inside of another frame. Once the frame is released on the other side of the tunnel, it acts as it would if it were on the network where it, where it originated, allowing the user to access network resources if, as if he or she were locally logged onto that network. Many VPN tunneling protocols operate the data link layer to encapsulate the VPN frame inside a network layer packet. Some VPN tunneling protocols work instead of at layer 3, 
which enables additional features and options, uh, especially for site-to-site -site VPN traffic. Most tunneling protocols rely on an additional encryption protocol to provide data security. Here we see a PPP frame encapsulated inside of a VPN frame that is encrypted by IPsec. Now, some common VPN tunneling protocols are PPTP, point-to-point -point tunneling protocol. It's an older layer two protocol developed by Microsoft that encapsulates VPN data frames, uses the TCP segments at the, uh, at the transport layer, supports uh, the encryption, authentication, and access services provided by the VPN server. However, it, it itself is outdated and is no longer considered secure. We also have L2TP, which is the layer two tunneling protocol. It's a VPN tunneling protocol based on a technology developed by Cisco and standardized by the IETF. It encapsulates the PPP data in a similar manner to PPTP, but differs in a few key ways. Unlike PPTP, it is a standard accepted and used by multiple vendors, so it can connect a VPN that uses a mix of, equip mix of equipment types. For example, a Juniper router, a Cisco router, and a Netgear router. Also, it can connect two routers, a router and remote access server, or a client and remote access server. Typically, the L2TP is implemented with IPsec for security, and this combination is considered secure and acceptable for most situations. There is also GRE, which is the generic routing encapsulation developed by Cisco. It's a layer three protocol used to transmit PPP, IP, and other kinds of messages through a tunnel. Like L2TP, GRE is used in conjunction with IPsec to, IPsec to increase the security. We also have OpenVPN, which is an open source protocol that uses a custom security protocol called OpenSSL for encryption. It has the ability to cross many firewalls where IPsec might be blocked. It is both highly secure and highly configurable. We also have the IKE version 2, which, as you learned earlier, is a component of the IPsec protocol suite. It offers fast throughput and good stability when moving between wireless hotspots. It's compatible with a wide variety of devices and is often recommended by VPN providers as the most secure option among the VPN protocols that they support. Here you can see the common requirements. Devices used for remote access must be kept uh, up to date with patches. Okay, these are common requirements for remote access policy. I'm sorry. A good remote access policy protects the company's data network and liability, no matter what type of remote access is involved. Here are some common requirements. Devices used for remote access must be kept up to date with patches, anti-malware, software, and a firewall. Devices uh, access must be controlled by a strong password or biometric measures like a fingerprint, retina, or facial recognition. Password must be strong and must be changed periodically. Passwords cannot be shared, even with a family member. The device's internal and external storage uh, devices must be encrypted. Note that some countries require that encrypted storage devices be decrypted or that encryption keys be filed with authorities. Uh, company and customer data that is accessed, transferred, stored, or printed must be kept secure. And the loss of theft of any devices used for remote access or to process remotely accessed data, such as a printer, must be reported to the company immediately or within a reasonable time frame, usually within 72 hours. Encrypted VPN software must be used to remotely access uh, company network resources. Typically, these options are clearly defined in the policy. And while remotely connected to the company network, the device must not be connected to the open internet or any other network not fully owned or and controlled by the employee. This restriction is usually built into enterprise VPN solutions. And remote sessions must be terminated uh, when not in use. In most cases, remote sessions should be configured to timeout automatically as a precaution. 
So in summary, virtualization is a virtual or logical version of something rather than the actual or physical version. Hypervisor is a software that creates and manages the VM. It manages resource allocation and sharing between host and any guest VMs. VMs can go through a virtual switch on the host computer to reach the physical network and communicate with physical and virtual routers. Other network devices and other hosts in the local or other network. The way the a NIC, a VNIC is configured determines whether the VM is joined to a virtual network or campus. <clears throat> now, although bridged mode of uh, VNIC uh, communicates through host adapter, it obtains its own IP address, gateway, and southern mass typically from a DHCP server on the physical LAN. In NAT mode, it relies on the host machine to act as a NAT device. In other words, the VM obtains IP addressing information from its host rather than the server, router, and the network. Host only mode, VMs on one host can exchange data with another um, and their with, with each other on their host, but they cannot communicate with nodes beyond the host. Although virtualization reduces the number of physical machines, it increases complexity and administrative burden in other ways. Network virtual uh, Network function uh, virtualization provides flexible cost saving options for many types of networking devices, including virtual servers, data storage, uh, load balancers, and firewalls. Software defined networking is a centralized approach to networking that removes most of the decision making power from the network devices. Cloud computing covers a broad range of services from hosting websites and database servers to providing virtual servers for collaboration uh, or software development. Cloud computing services. Uh, service models are categorized by the types of services they provide. Uh, the NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, uh, has developed a standard definition for each category, which varies by the division of labor uh, implemented. Three common cloud um, services or models are uh, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and software as a service. Incrementally increase the amount of management responsibilities outsourced to cloud computing vendors. Their cloud services are delivered in a variety of deployment methods, uh, depending on who manages the cloud and who has access to it. The main deployment models that you are likely to encounter are public cloud, private cloud, community cloud, and hybrid cloud. One way to reduce the inherent risk of cloud computing is to use encryption. Data exists uh, generally in three states, um, in motion, in use, and at rest. Encryption is the last means of defense against data theft. Most common kind of encryption codes, uh, kind of encryption encodes the original data's bits using a key or a random string of characters, sometimes several times in different sequences to scramble the data and from it, generate a unique and consistently sized data black called a ciphertext. The key is created according to a specific set of rules or algorithms. IPsec is an encryption protocol suite that defines a set of rules for encryption, authentication, and key management for TCP IP transmissions. It works at the network layer of the OSI model and it adds security information to the headers of all IP packets and encrypts the data payload. SSL, Secure Socket Layer, and Transport Layer Security, TLS, are both methods of encrypting TCP IP transmissions, including web pages and data to enter into web forms. Remote access, as a remote user can connect to a network in its, in its resources, uh, via remote access, which is a service that allows a client to connect with and log on to a server LAN when in a different geographical location. After connecting, a remote client can access files, applications, and other shared, shared resources, such as printers, like as if they were on the current LAN or WAN.
SSH is a collection of protocols that does both authentication and encryption. RDP is a protocol of remote desktop Microsoft proprietary used by Windows Remote Desktop and Remote Access Client Server Utilities to connect to and control a remote computer. Similarly, VNC, Virtual Network Computing, uses the cross-platform protocol RFB, Remote Frame Buffer, to remotely control a workstation or server. Increasingly, networking devices are configured to a connected computer's browser and navigates to a management URL. Out-of-band management relies on a dedicated connection with each critical network server, such as routers, firewall servers, etc. There are three remote file access technologies, FTP, uh, related to FTP. We have FTPS, SFTP, and TFTP. Please remember that a VPN is a network connection encrypted from end to end that creates a private connection to remote network. And to ensure uh, a VPN can carry all types of data in a private manner over any kind of connection. Special VPN protocols encapsulate higher layer protocols. Regardless of the type of remote access made available to employees, a good remote access policy further protects a company's data network and liability. This is the end of our, uh, of our lesson uh, for today. Uh, please uh, come back again and uh, we'll see if we can get the chapter eight up for you. Thank you and have a good day.